Thank you, Brother Williams. Greetings, Brother Shalano and his wife and all the delegates here at this uh, banquet tonight. It's certainly a great privilege to be here. I've looked forward for this hour ever since we started this away. And uh, I want to thank that lady. I can't think of her name. Billy just told me to give me a box of Christmas candy he just brought out of the car a few moments ago. The sister, I can't think of her name. She's from here in California. That's my first Christmas present. So uh, I thank you for it. Now, tonight, uh, it's um, in Tucson. It's 10 minutes after 9. But I think it's just 10 minutes after 8 here. Huh? So we... <coughs> I have a kind of a feeling amongst the people I'm kind of long-winded in preaching, so I, I hope. <laughs> thank you. That's a, some nice persons in here. I uh, thank you, but I'm I'm just a little bit preached out almost tonight. I've been going so long from from Shreveport and across the country, coming this way night after night. You get just a little. A little shook up, you know, and cold, and your throat gets hoarse. I started out Shreveport. I uh, lost my hair when I was a few years ago, and I had a little piece I put on when I'm preaching in the North Country to keep them taking the cold. I went to Shreveport and forgot it. <laughs> I really got a cold when that wind coming across like that. You really you just don't know. It was taken out accidentally, and its skin still soft, and just a little perspiration. And I've really got it in the throat. Had to close many meetings, so I'm, um, I'm just a teeny bit hoarse tonight. We want to say we've had a wonderful time coming across here, oh, in the meetings last night. We had a wonderful time up in, with the brethren up to the other chapter, and uh, so had a great crowd out and wonderful attendance. The people so reverent and nice. So it makes me feel real good to be a part of the full gospel businessman. It's uh, been, I have a message I feel from God. It's a little odd to some people and I can't help being a more, I just got to be what I am. And uh, we, I don't mean to be different. It's just that I, I'm living at a changing time where as long as you're building the wall one straight way, it's all fine. The, the bricklayers can go right down the road, but when you have to turn the corner, that's where the time. And we're not building a wall. We're building a house, you see. So these turns has to come. It come in the age of Martin Luther, John Wesley, and the Pentecostal age. It's here again. So we, uh, it's hard to turn the corners. But I'm so thankful for uh, to God. Even though how t rough it's been, the people has responded 100%. So we're very grateful. Thank each one of you. And now, before we open the book. Let's speak to the author, if you will, just a moment while we bow our heads. Dear God, we are grateful to you tonight for the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son, and the free pardoning of our sins, and to know that His blood is sufficient, that's covered all of our sins and our iniquities. They're so blotted out and put in the sea of God's forgiveness and his bride will stand at the wedding supper, pure, unadulterated, to marry the Son of God. How we thank thee for this all-sufficiency and the faith to know that we do not trust in our own merits, but in his merit alone for what he did for us. We're so grateful. Thank you for the, the success that these brethren had overseas in the countries over there where they're hungering and thirsting. For God, I pray, Lord, that if they go back again, that those children that they brought into the kingdom will be great grandmothers and grandfathers of the children that they bring in also. Grant it, Father. Bless us together tonight. And may the Holy Spirit uh, give to us the things that we have need of. Close our mouths to the things that we should not say. And open our hearts to receive what you would tell us. Grant it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, let's uh, turn in the Bible to a, a little text that I would like to speak on for a while tonight. And it's found over in St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And um, I have 
few years ago when I would speak, I, would, I wouldn't even have to write a note. I could remember it. And I didn't have to take a pair of glasses to read out of the Bible. But since I passed 25 now, <laughs> twice, <laughs> so it's kind of a little hard for me to, to do like I used to do. It's like a war in our car, but I'm still running. <laughs> I want to keep on chuggling along till it's I go to the scrap heap to be molded over again. That's the promise. St. Luke, the 10th chapter, and began at the, uh, I believe I said the 21st verse, if I can find it here somewhere. Uh, I'm mistaken. It's St. Mark. I'm sorry. St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And... Um, the 20, beginning with the 21st verse I want to read. Well, let's get to the 17th verse, or rather. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling down to him and asked him, saying, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's is None good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then said, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing Thou likest, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and take up thy cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, we're going to speak tonight on a subject. I want my text to be, follow me, and my subject, leadership. Now, it's a strange, but I thought maybe today in praying, and I've been so long, and each night, right down the line on the message that I have, uh, the Lord has given to me to speak on, I thought tonight, over in this new chapter, I would approach it from a different standpoint. And uh, many times, we've talked on this, call it the rich young ruler, and and many of the ministers here, my brethren, no doubt, have approached it in many different ways. And I will try to approach it in a, a different way tonight than I ever have. This uh, of leadership. This, uh, remember this, that each one of us, young and old, your first step that you ever made in your life, someone had to lead you. That's right. And your last step you ever make, someone will be leading you. Someone has to lead. God has likened us unto sheep. And if anyone knows about raising sheep and the nature of sheep, why, well, you know that a sheep cannot find his way around. He has to be led. Even in the slaughter pens, we find that they bring the sheep there and he's led up into the slaughter by a goat. A goat leads them up. And then when he gets up to the end of the chute, he jumps out. The sheep goes right on into the slaughter. So the, we find that a sheep cannot find his way around. I remember an experience I had with one. One time I was a state game warden in Indiana, and I'd been out in the field, and I heard something, a most pitiful cry, and it was a, a little lamb had, had lost his mama, and he couldn't find his way to her, and the mother couldn't find her way to the, to the little lamb. And I picked the little fellow up, and how quiet he laid against me, and I went along there, my hands holding a little fella and crying. And as I heard him, how he just snugged his little head down against me. And it seemed like he knew that I, I, I was uh, going to help him. I thought, oh, rock of ages, cleft for me. Uh, pick me up in the arms of the Lord Jesus. And just be content as I know I'm, I'm going to go home to be with my loved ones. And I thought at the end of my life's journey, just bring me in your arms, Lord, like that. And I know I'll be carried across the river then on the other side where there will be no sorrows and sicknesses and things. And I'll be with the loved ones that I've loved. And um, if you study nature, there's a great thing in nature. Everything that I 
that I look at, and God has made, He's the author of nature. Nature runs in continuity. All nature runs about the same. If you notice everything, as I have said, I believe last evening, that nature testifies of God. If you never had a Bible, you could still watch nature and know that this Bible is the truth. I've I had the privilege of being round around the world. I've read uh, different phases, and I've seen different religions, the Mohammeds, and I've read the Koran, and, and seen the Sikhs, the Jains, and Mohammeds, and the Buddhas, and what more. But yet, each one of them, they have a philosophy, and a, 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 a book of creed, and a book of uh, laws, and so forth. But our Bible is the truth, and our God is the only one that is right. Because each one of them has to point to a grave somewhere where their founder is still laying. But Christianity points to an open tomb Amen. and can live in the presence of the one that was put in there. He is alive. Amen. It's not a God that was. It's a God that is. Not a I was or I will be, but I am. And all nature runs in continuity. As I've said, talking on our church ages, which we have the books now is coming out. Uh, the what did I about my writing of the church ages and how that we see the church, how it's matured, come up just exactly like uh, all nature does. And we was talking the other day about how the sun rises in the morning. It's a little baby, real weak, not much strength to it at all. And as the day goes on, it gets stronger, stronger. About eight o'clock, it enters school like a young boy or young girl. And then about 11 o'clock, it's out uh, of school, and it's ready for its, its service. And then across till about 3 o'clock, it changes into middle life, into old age, and then dies in the afternoon. Is that the end of the sun? No, it comes back the next morning to testify that there is a life, a death, a burial, a resurrection. Hallelujah. We watch the trees, how they move and what they do. I was some time ago down in Kentucky. I, I like to squirrel hunt. And I went out in the fall of the year there to squirrel hunt with a friend of mine. And it's uh, got very dry. And anyone ever hunted gray squirrel know that how hard it is to slip up on them when the, the leaves just crack one. And oh, Houdini is an amateur skate artist to, to those fellows. How they can get away. And then trying to shoot eye shots at 50 yards. It takes some good hunting to get your limit in a day. So Mr. Wood, a friend of mine, a, a converted Jehovah Witness, uh, was with me. And we, he said, I know a farm over here where there's a man that's got a lot of, we call them there, hollers. How many know what a holler is? Amen. Well, what part of Kentucky are you from, anyhow? And um, uh, that's where I'm from. Like here, one of the chapters not long ago, I have to tell this to Brother Williams and them. Brother, they said, we will now stand and sing the national anthem. anthem. And I said, for my old Kentucky home. Well, nobody joined in with me, so that's the only anthem I knew. And so uh, we was, um, we was, um, um, all right, sir, please have a uh, prayer for a lady right now is bleeding at the nose. Let us pray. Dear God, I ask you, Lord, thou art the great healer. I ask that your grace and mercy will touch this dear woman just now and stop that blood. As a believing people who symbol together, the lady has come here to enjoy the word of the Lord and the fellowship of the people. And I ask you, Lord, just now to rebuke the enemy and stop the blood. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And we believe it. On with the little story just to kind of get a feeling before we get right down into a few notes I've got written here in some scripture. Now, he said, well, uh, this old man will go over and see him. He's got a lot of hollers in his place. He said, but he's an infidel. He said, if uh, he just about curse us out if we went over there. I said, but we're not getting no squirrels here. We've been camping two weeks and we're just dirty and beard all out on our face. Now, he said, well, I said, let's go over. So we went a few miles down, about 20 miles. I've been in the country down there once before for three nights at a Methodist campground where there had been some great things the Lord had did, a great healing service amongst the Methodist people. 
And then we went way back over some hills and hollers and ridges, and you just have to know Kentucky to know it, uh, what kind of a place you had to get into. And while we went back there, we come to a house, and uh, there sat an, an old man, two old men sitting out there with the old hat slapped down over their face. And, and uh, he said, there he is. And said, he's a tough one. He said, he hates the word of a preacher. He said, so I said, well, I just better sit in the car. We won't get to hunt at all. I said, you go in and ask him if we can hunt. So he got out, started walking in. He spoke to them. And in Kentucky always, you know, it's come in and so forth. And so he went up there and he said, uh, I just wondered if we could uh, hunt a while on your place. The old man sitting there about... 75 years old, tobacco running down his mouth. He said, spit. He said, what's your name? He said, my name is Wood. He said, are you any relation to old man Jim that used to live? He said, yeah, I'm Jim's boy. He said, I'm Banks, Jim. Well, he said, old man Jim was an honest man. He said, certainly help yourself. He said, uh, uh, he said are you by yourself? He said, no, uh, uh, my pastor is out there. He said, what? <laughs> He said, my pastor is out in a car, said he's hunting with me. He said, Wood, you don't mean you've got so low down until you have to tote a preacher with you wherever you go. <laughs> so he's a rough old character. So uh, I thought I'd better get out of the car, you know. So I got out and walked around. And um, he said, well, and you're a preacher, huh? I said, yes, sir. He looked me up and down, squirrel, blood, and dirt. and fit. He said, I said, don't look much like it. He said, well, I kind of like that. He said, you know, I want to tell you something. He said, uh, I'm supposed to be an infidel. I said, yes, sir, I understood that. I said, I don't think it's much to brag about, though, to you. He said, well, he said, I don't know. He said, I'm going to tell you what I think of you guys. I said, all right. He said, you're barking up the wrong tree. And uh, how many knows what that means? See, it means it's a lying dog, you see. The coon is not up there at all, see. He said, you're barking up the wrong tree. I said, that's to opinion. And uh, he said, um, well, he said, look, you see that old chimney stand up there? Yes, said, I was born up there 75 years ago. And said, I've lived right here in these hills all around here all these years. And said, I've looked towards the skies. I've looked here and there. And surely in all these 75 years, I would have seen something that looked like God. Didn't you think so? I said, well, it depends on what you're looking at. Here, what you're looking for. And he said, well, he said, I... I certainly don't believe there is such a creature, and I believe you fellows just simply get out and swindle the people out of their money and everything, and that's the way it goes. I said, well, uh, you're an American citizen. You have a right to your own own thinking. He said, there's one guy one time that I heard of. He said that I would uh, sure, uh, if he ever uh, get to talk with that fellow, said, I'd like to, to ask him a few questions. I said, yes, sir. He said it was a preacher. You might know him. He said he had a meeting up here in Camelsville not long ago in a churchyard up there, a campground. And he said, I forget his name. He said he's from Indiana. And, uh, and I said, oh, yes, sir. And Brother Wood started saying, well, I don't say that. And so he said, um, I said, what about him? He said, well, he said, old lady somebody up there on the hill said, you know, she was dying with cancer. And said, wife and I would go up there of a morning to, to uh, change her bed. Said they couldn't even raise her up high enough to put her on the bedpan. Said they just had to pull a draw sheet. And said she was dying. She had been to Louisville and said the doctors had give her up. And said she was going to die. And her sister went up to that meeting and said, that preacher was standing up on a platform, looked back over the audience and called this woman by name and told her when she left, she took a handkerchief and put it in her, her purse and called this woman's name down here, 20 miles below here, said how she was suffering with cancer, what her name was, and all she had been through. Said, take that handkerchief and go lay it on the woman, and said, the woman will be healed of her cancer. And said, they come down here that night, and said, honest, I heard the office screaming up there. I thought they had the Salvation Army turned loose on top of the hill up there. Said, well, I said, I guess old sister's dead. Said, we'll, tomorrow we'll... Go and get the wagon, how we take her out to get to the main road, and said, so they can take her to the undertaker. And said that uh, we waited, no need to go up that time of night, said it's about a mile up on the hill here. Said we went up there the next morning, and you know what happened? I said, No, sir. He said, She was sitting there eating fried apple pies and drinking coffee with her husband. <laughs> I said, You mean that? He said, Yes, sir. 
Oh, I said, now, mister, you really don't mean that. He said, what bothers me is what, uh, how did that man and never in this country and knew that? And I said, oh, you don't believe that. He said, it's the truth. I said, you believe that? See, he's, he said, well, go right up there on a the hill. I can prove it to you. He's preaching back to me now. He said, so I, I said, mm -mm. I picked up an apple and, and I said, can I have one of these apples? And I rubbed it on my clothes. He said, well, the yellow jackets are eating them up. I guess you can have one. And, uh, and I said, uh, well, um, I, I bit into it. And I said, that's a nice apple. He said, oh, yes. I said, you know what? I planted that tree there all oh, 40 years ago or something like that. I said, oh, is that right? Yes, sir. And I said, well, um, and every year I said, I noticed we haven't had no frost yet. It's early August. And I said, them leaves are falling off the trees. Yes, sir. Said, That's right. It's coming on fall. Believe we're going to have an early one this time. I said, yes, sir. Change the subject. See, and he said, uh, I said, well, you know, um, uh, it's strange. I said, um, how that uh, sap goes out of that tree. I said, and them leaves falls off. And yet there's no, uh, they, they haven't had no frost to kill the leaf. And he said, uh, well, he said, uh, what's that got to do with what we're talking about? And I said, well, I, I just wondered, you know, Mama always said, give a cow enough rope and it'll hang itself, you know, so I just give him plenty of rope. So he went on out. He said, uh, well, yes, what's that got to do with it? I said, you know, uh, God uh, brings them apples up. And you enjoy those apples and leaves, he said, in the shade and so forth. It goes down in the fall of the year. And I said, uh, comes back up again with the apples and with the leaves again. And um, he said, oh, that's just nature. See, that's just nature. I said, well, of course that's nature. I said, that's nature. But somebody has to control nature. See, I, he said, uh, you tell me now, what does that? He said, well, it's just, just naturally nature. I said, who is it that says to that little leaf now? And uh, I said, now, the reason that leaf falls off is because the sap goes down into the root. And what if that sap stayed up in the tree through the wintertime? What would happen? He said it would kill the tree. Well, I said, now, what intelligence that runs that sap down into the roots says, get out of here now. It's coming fall of the year. Get down into the roots and hide and stay down into the roots like a grave. And then next spring comes back up again, brings up more apples and brings up more leaves and things. He said, that's just nature. It'll do it. I said, the weather, the changing, and oh, it's coming on fall. I said, set a bucket of water on the post out there and see if nature runs it down the bottom of the post and brings it back up again. See? <laughs> well, he said, you might have something. I said, think of it while we go hunting. And he said, uh, well, he said, hunt where you want to. And I said, when I come back, if you'll tell me what intelligence runs that sap out of that tree down into the roots to stay all winter and come back the next winter, I'll tell you that's the same intelligence that told me about that woman up there. I said, told you. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're not that preacher. I said, would you know his name? He said, yes. I said, Branham. He said, that's him. I said, that's right. <laughs> and you know what? I led the old man to Christ right there on his own testimony. And a year later, I was down there and pulled a car, Indiana license on, in the yard. They'd moved away. He had died. And so when I come back, there stood his wife to really break me over. <laughs> I thought I had permission to hunt. And she come out there. She said, can't you read? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, did you see those signs saying no hunting? I said, yes, ma'am. But I said, I, I have permission. You do not have permission, she said. And said, we've got this pay, place posted for many years. I said, well, J sister, I, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. He said, sorry, nothing. Them Indiana license on there and set up here. You're the boldest people. I said, uh, could I just explain it? I said, uh, she said, who gave you permission? I said, I don't know. Just I said it was an elderly man uh, sitting out on the porch. Uh, when I was down here last year, and we was talking about God, see? And she, looked, she said, are you Brother Branham? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, forgive me. I didn't know who you were. She said, I want to tell you his testimony. In his last dying hours, he raised up his hands and praised God. said, he died in Christian faith and was carried away to God. Hallelujah. See, if they hold their peace, the rocks will immediately cry out. There's something in nature. Watch the birds. Watch the animals. Watch everything. And you watch nature. Watch the little dove, how he flies. What a different bird he is. See, he, he doesn't have any gall. He can't eat like the crow can, see. 
He has no gall in him. He doesn't have to take a bath in the, in the, in the water because he's got something on the inside of him. It cleans him from the inside out. You see, and that's the way the Christian is. That's the way God represents himself in a, in a, in a dove. See, because in the, Jesus was represented as a lamb. Always in nature, you'll find God. And God likened us unto sheep. That has to be led. Did you ever notice our priest's sermon on it sometime ago that the dove coming down on the lamb to lead the lamb and it led him to the slaughter? The dove. Now, if the lamb, that dove could not have descended upon any other type of animal because they both had to be of the same nature. See, if the dove would have lit up on a wolf and he would have snorted or growled, the dove would have took its flight. Well, that's the same way now. And our ill ways, the Holy Spirit just takes its flight and goes away. It's got to have the same nature. The bird of the heavens, the dove, the meekest animal on earth, the lamb, they can agree together. And when the Holy Spirit comes up on us and makes us new creatures, then He can lead us. But we try to live the same old life. It won't work. It just won't work. Now, the first step you've probably ever taken in your life, speaking of leadership, it was probably the hands of some kind old mother. Them hands may be still tonight out here in some cemetery somewhere. But that was the hand that helped you to make your first step. Then after your mother taught you how to walk and you'd make a few steps and fall down and get up and you thought you were doing great things, then she turned you over to the school teacher. And then she began to lead you to an education how what you must do and how you must learn and, and so forth like that. Then after the school teacher got through with you, then you returned back, your father got a hold of you. Then when your father got a hold of you, he taught you perhaps your business, how to be a successful businessman, how to do things right. Your mother taught you how to be a, a housewife, how to cook and so forth like that. Then after they got through with you, then... Your minister or priest got a hold of you. But now, who leads you? That's the question now. Now, we're all led by something tonight. We have to be. We're led. Notice. Now, let's uh, look at this young fellow's, uh, what had influenced him. Let's look at the, uh, this young businessman, we would call him, because he was a businessman. He was a great, successful man. Let's look at his leaders. Perhaps first his mother had taught him as a little boy the things that he should do. His father had made him such a fine success and maybe left him, an, left him an inheritance because he was a ruler himself. Perhaps his father was gone, so he is a, a businessman. He was, a, let's call him today a, like a Christian businessman. Or he was a religious businessman, I think would be the best quotation. This man was religious. He was by no means an infidel. And he had been taught by his mother how to do right, how to walk, how to dress himself. He had been taught by his father a great business and how to be a successful man. And his business was successful. And father and mother had been raised up in the church and appointed him to the priest. And the priest had made him a real religious man. Therefore, he was a fine, cultured man. He was a fine uh, boy with good character. If Jesus Christ looked at him and loved him, there was something about the boy that was real. Amen. Right? Yeah. For the Bible said here, we find out in Mark, and Jesus beholding him, loved him. Yeah, Jesus beholding him, loved him. So therefore, there must be something real outstanding about this young fellow. He was, uh, had a good character, a good character reading, he was a man that was raised right, intelligent, smart, intellectual, successful in business, and a religious man. He had a lot of good characteristics that was outstanding so much that it attracted the attention of Jesus Christ the Savior. But when he was confronted, being successful in all these other things, nothing had went wrong. He was perfectly cut out right, measured up right. Intelligent, right education, his success, is smart, a fine businessman, probably belonged to a businessman's group somewhere there in Palestine. He might have belonged to a businessman's fellowship like we have here tonight. No doubt he did, because businessmen has always had fellowships with another, one with the other. 
because it's just like birds of a feather. They have things to talk about. And if this the religious man, they don't want to talk about the man that runs the bar room and the, all of them together because they have nothing in common. We've got to have things in common. So Christians has things in common with Christians. Sinners has things in common with, with sinners. And, and societies and whatever they are, they have things in common. This young boy probably belonged to a uh, businessman's fellowship. And he was religious as he could be because Jesus, in questioning here, he said, I have kept these commandments, observed them all from my youth. That's right. See, he had been brought up right, taught right, and everything. But when he was confronted with the, uh, the thought of eternal life, now I want you to notice with all this character that he had, he yet knew he did not possess eternal life. Now, all of our societies, our church, our membership, and the things that we hold so dear, our uh, American societies, and everything is very fine. There's nothing to be said against that. And our Christian businessman society here is a great thing. It's been an open door for me to, on my interdenominational thoughts that we are Christians. There is no one, no one denomination can claim us a real Christian because you belong to God. Amen. Denominations are man-made. And Christianity is heaven sent. But in all these things that we have, as good as they are, as fine as we come together, and as nice of meetings as we have, and social understanding that we have, yet we are each one confronted with eternal life. Amen. No matter how successful we've been in business, how successful we've been, and what a great church member we are, how we work, how we try to do things right, Still, if it's not done in the right way, it is a worship of God in vain. Jesus placed that the same way as I stop here for a moment. He said, in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. Now think, a sincere, honest worship of the sincerity of your heart to God and still be in vain. It began that way with Cain. At the Garden of Eden. Sincere worship, but was rejected. Very religious, still rejected. In Shreveport last week, a uh, week before last at a businessman's meeting, a breakfast there where several hundreds of people had gathered. I took two and a half hours to speak on doing God a service without being God's will. Now that sounds strange. But we've got to channel ourselves into God's provided channel and God's way of doing it. No matter how much we think it's right, it's got to be according to the word of the Lord or it's in vain. Cain worshiped, but it wasn't according to the word of the Lord. The Pharisees worship, but not according to the word of the Lord. And in this uh, particular message to the businessman, I taught this. David, he wanted to do the Lord a service. And he was right in what he said. He said, is it right for the ark of the Lord to be down there? Let's bring it up here. In the days of the king, the other king, he succeeded. He said, it's not right. They never consulted the Lord by the ark. But we must do it. Now, that's correct what they should have done. Amen. He said, we should go get the ark and we could consult the Lord. And that's right. It was down in another country. He said, we got to bring it up here. Get up here and, and put it in our house here and worship the Lord. Now, notice... He went in the wrong channel to do it. Amen. He consulted the captains of fifties and hundreds and thousands. They all was consulted, everyone, seeing it was the will of the Lord look like, or it was a, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord sometimes, you had to put it in its right place, or it's not the will of the Lord. Amen. I'll let that soak deep. And you'll get a, a general conception of what I'm trying to say. I don't want the church to fall into the steps that you found over there in England. Long hair and painted face man and pervert. We don't want that. No matter how religious it sounds and how much Elvis Presley can sing religious songs, he's still a devil. I'm no judge, but by their fruits you know them. He's a Pentecostal, but that don't make a bit of difference. 
your fruits bear record of what you are. No matter if the Spirit comes up on him, he can speak in tongues, he can shout, he can heal the sick. And Jesus said, many of them will come to me in that day and say, Lord, haven't I done this and that? And I say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never even knew you. See? We've got to be real, genuine Christians. And the only way we can do that is confronted with this question here of eternal life. There's only one form of eternal life, and that comes from God. And He foreordained every creature that would ever have it. Just as you were the Jane in your father, you was a Jane in God, one of His attributes to begin with, or you'll never be there. You come forth in the bedding ground of your mother. Your father didn't know you. You were in his loins. And when you come forth in the bedding ground of the mother, then you become a human being and made in the image of your father. Now you can fellowship with him in the same thing by God. If you got eternal life, the life that you come in, the natural life, physical life, that was by your father. And the only way you can come born again is the only way is it has to be from your heavenly father. His attributes, all the father has given me, will come to me. You are here because your name were placed on the Lamb's book of life before there was even a foundation of the world. That's exactly right. You're a Jane, a spiritual Jane out of your heavenly Father, a part of God's Word. That be so, as I've said, then you was with Jesus when He was here because He was the Word. You suffered with Him, died with Him, buried with Him, and rose with Him. And now sitting in heavenly places in Him. Notice, David thought everything was fine. And he consulted all these people. And they, everyone began to dance and shout and scream. They had all the religious motions that there was. But still, it wasn't God's will. To go down and bring the Word of God back to the house of God. But you see, God always, in all ages, works through one way. His first decision is His only decision because He's perfect in His decisions. He never does nothing except he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Amen. Exactly. That's why this, the church age that we live in, there's no church, no Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostals, or anything else can ever put this church into the bride. It'll have to be the answering of Malachi 4 for God to send a prophet to be revealed to because that's the only way our churches denominate and throw the thing into a mess and a huddle. It's like they've always been and God always sends the prophets. Amen. And there was Nathan standing in the land, a vindicated prophet before God, and he wasn't even consulted. And they went down there and caused the life of an honest man and so forth and took the ark. Instead of putting it on the shoulders of the Levites to pack it, they put it on a cart to pack it. All together messed up. Uh, you see, if you don't go according to the, the will of God and the way that God has given us to go, they always get it messed up and take it off in some organization, denomination, some message, and there you go. Right. See? It's right. always been done that way. That's the same thing that this boy was confronted with. He'd come in, he'd been a, a, a member of maybe the Pharisees or Sadducees or some great uh, order of that day. He was religious as he could be. He said, I've observed these commandments that have been taught since I was a youth. And Jesus loved him for it. But he refused to be guided. He refused to accept the real leadership of Jesus Christ to give him eternal life. Notice he believed there was something different than what he had. Or he would never said, good master, what must I do now? See, he wanted to do something himself. That's the way we do. We want to do something ourselves. The gift of God is a free gift. God give it to you. Don't do one thing for it. He ordained it to you, and you're going to have it. See? Notice, he knew it was there. He believed in it and wanted it. But when he was confronted with how he had to do it, it was different from his ritual. It was different. He could hold his money and belong on to the church that he belonged to and so forth. But Jesus knew that and knew it. He hoarded this money, and he said, Go sell all you've got and give it to the poor, and come take up your cross and follow me, and you'll have treasures in heaven. But he couldn't do it. The other leaders that he had had in his youthful days had such an influence on him till he refused to accept God's provided way, which was Jesus Christ, the only one who holds eternal life. The only one that can give you. Not the church can give you eternal life. Not your neighbor. Not your pastor. Not your priest. Not your creed. Only Jesus Christ himself can give you eternal life. Amen. No matter how good you are, what you quit doing, what you start doing, 
you've got to accept the person Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then when you do that, He is the Word, and then your life fits right in the Word, and it manifests itself to this age that you're living in. Amen. Noah had to do that for the Word to be manifested in his age. Now, what if Moses come along and said, we know what Noah done. We'll take Noah's uh, word. We'll do it just the way Noah did it. We'll build an a ark and float down the Nile River and go out of Egypt. What well, wouldn't have worked. See, that was another age. Jesus couldn't have come with Moses' message. Luther couldn't come with the Catholic message. The Wesley couldn't come with the Luther's message. The Pentecost couldn't come with the Wesley message. And the bride can't be formed in the Pentecostal denomination. It just can't do it. That's exactly right. She's done organized and went out here and there. She sets. Just like the rest of them. It's a shuck. Just like the life comes up to the... See, that writer, as I spoke the other night, that writer that wrote this book, and not because he criticized me so bad, said I was the devil, uh, if there was such a thing. So he said he didn't believe in God. He said a God that could fold his arms and set up and watch them martyrs through the early ages and claim to have power to open the Red Sea and let them women and children be torn to pieces by lions and so forth, and then said he was a loving God. So there's no such a creature. See, the fellow without inspiration of the word fails to see it. The first corn of wheat, the bridegroom, had to fall into the earth in order to rise again. So did the first bride that was born at Pentecost had to go through that dark ages like any other seed, be buried. They had to die. Amen. They must do it. But it started sprouting again in Luther in the first Reformation. It didn't look like the seed that went in, but it was the light of that day. The lost dog then went on into the tossel, Wesley. And from the tossel, it went into Pentecost, the shuck. When you see into the, the wheat, when it comes forth, the corn of wheat, a man that's raised wheat, you go out and see that wheat farm in there. It looks just exactly like the grain. But if you'll take a tweezer and sit down and take that wheat and open it up, there's no grain there at all. It's just a shuck. And then what is it's formed there to hold the grain. See, and then the first thing you know, the life left the, the, the stalk to go into the tassel, left the tassel, go into the shuck. It leaves the shuck and goes into the wheat. Three stages, see, of it, and then forms the wheat outside of the three stages. Luther, Wesley, Pentecost. Exactly. See, no doubt you can't interrupt nature. Now, look, every three years after a message has went forth, sent from God, they organize. This has been 20 years, and there's no organization. It won't. See, now the shuck has to pull away, give the wheat a chance to lay before the sun to ripen. Um, the message coming right back into the church again, forming the body of Jesus Christ, just like the first original one that went into the ground. Now, to see. Go, uh, the eternal life, the life, sure, the the stalk back here carried the life. Certainly it did. But you see, when it became the stalk and it was finished, the organization, the life went right on into Wesley. Come right out when it, and watch each one of them want a big blade, don't look like the grain. But when the little pollen comes, like the on the the sh or on the stalk, the pollen of the tassel, it looks a whole lot like the grain. But when it comes down to that shuck. It's almost there. Didn't Jesus say in the last days, Matthew 24, 24, the two would be so close it would deceive the very genes, predestinated, the elected ones, if it was possible. Amen. Almost Amen. like the real thing. See? So in the last days. Now, you see, it's wheat time now. It's getting harvest time. This is not Luther's age. This is not Pentecost age. This is a bride age. Amen. As Moses called a nation out of a nation, Christ today is calling a church out of a church. You see, the same thing in type. Take them to the glorious, eternal, promised land. Now, to refuse that person that's doing the calling, Christ, no matter if you're Pentecostal, Methodist, Luther, whatever you are, you've got to this age, nothing against them, not at all, but in this age, now, you've got to accept, like they did in that age, the person of Christ, which is the Word. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Hebrews 13, 8. See? You must accept that person of eternal life. Now, what life Luther had was justification. 
Wesley had sanctification added to it. The Pentecost had the restoration of the gifts coming back in it added to it. But now it's completing in the body, you see, the three phases of it. And out of that, now when the resurrection comes, the life that lived in them Lutherans that went out, the life that lived in the Methodists and went out, the life that went in the Pentecostals will all be raptured out of the ground in the body of the bride to be taken in before Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God. Yeah. Oh, it's exciting. Amen. It's the truth. Hallelujah. We've turned a corner. Hallelujah. We're looking towards heaven. Yeah. Watching for the coming of the cap on the pyramid, as we would say. It's coming back. The church must be resurrected soon, and we must get ready. And the only way you can is not say, well, I belong to the assemblies. I belong to the uh, oneness, twoness, or whatever it is. All them there. I belong to the church of God. That don't mean a thing. Our fathers shouted and danced. That's perfectly all right. That was their day. But today, you're confronted not with the organization that they made, but with the life that's going on, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. This young fellow had done the same thing. Moses wrote those commandments. But you see, the same God that wrote the commandments by his prophet was the same thing that prophesied the day would come, I'll raise up a prophet like it unto me. Amen. It'll come to pass that all that don't hear him will be cut off back in the denominational shucks and tossels. They must go on to life. And today, don't say, well, I'm Pentecost. I belong to this. I belong to that. That don't mean nothing. You've got to accept the person, Christ. Eternal life confronts every one of us. Don't forget that. The other leaders, you see, it had such a hold on him. Their people just talk, well, we belong to this and we belong to that. and had such a hold on him. But what a fatal thing to reject the leadership of eternal life. Now, that life is present tonight. Amen. That's right. The Holy Spirit is here, which is Christ in spirit form. Amen. His spirit, the anointing. Is here a little while the world seeth me no more, yet ye will see me, for I'll be with you even in you Amen. to the consummation, to the end of the world. Jesus alone can lead you to that eternal life. Amen. There's no church, no denomination, no preacher, no priest, no nothing else can lead you to it. You must be led by Him. Amen. The only one that can lead you. Could you imagine Him leading you out of His Word, which that's Him? And if He is the Word and you're a part of Him, won't you be a part of the Word? Amen. The Word that God wants to pour the waters of salvation upon today to identify Him today. Amen. Like the apostles identified Him. Like Luther, like Wesley, like the people in them days identified Him. This is another age. It's a Word. The Word said these things that we're seeing taking place now is predicted to take place in this hour. So accept Jesus Christ and let Him lead you the eternal life. Though he had achieved this young fellow, he had achieved all good things. In school, been fine. As a good boy, no doubt he'd been good. As a real father and listened to his daddy, in business, he'd been a good, a good boy, good to his parents. He'd been loyal to his priest. He'd been loyal to his church. He'd been loyal to the commandments of God. But he lost the greatest thing and the rest of them didn't mean very much to him when he turned down the leadership of eternal life. Jesus Christ. Notice, this leadership confronts every one of us today. The same thing as it did that young man. We, No matter how religious we are, you may be Catholic, you may be Baptist, Methodist, or you may be Pentecostals or whatever you are. This same thing confronts you tonight. Eternal life. That's acceptance of Jesus Christ. We are given this opportunity. Sometime in life, we have to confront the thing just like this young man did. Because you are a mortal being and you're giving the, you're giving the opportunity of choice. You have a choice. God made it so you can choose. If he put Adam and Eve on free moral agency so they could choose, and then they made the wrong choice, and see, he can do no more to you than he did to them. He's got to put you the same thing. Amen. So you can choose or reject. You have a choice. Let's look at some of them. You have a choice as a young man whether you're going to have an education or not. You have that choice. You can want to be just not have it. You can just refuse it. You have a choice of your conduct. I'm going to hurt just a little bit here. You can go out and let your hair grow down and be a beetle or some of these ignoramuses. 
Or you women, you can look like a, a decent human being, or you can be one of these weird creatures that we have out there, them blue eyes and waterhead haircuts and things are completely against the Word of God, which is absolutely contrary, not even offer, couldn't offer a prayer to be accepted. That's true. That's exactly right. It's what the Bible said. But what's happened to you, church? You've seen so much television, so much things in the world. It's so easy for your old Adam nature to drift into that, to act like the rest of them. May I repeat this again? In the kosha, in the offering of the, the, the atonement, in the days of Moses, when Moses brought the children out, there was to be seven days that there was to be no eleven among the people. Anyone knows that? In Exodus. No eleven should be found in your camp at all. Seven days. That seven days represent the full seven church ages. Amen. See? No eleven. Now, what is that? No creed, no world. Jesus said, if you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Amen. See? And we're trying to mix that. You can't do it. You've got to come to one thing to believe. Yeah. You're either going to believe God, you're going to believe your church, you're going to believe the world. You're, you cannot mix it together. Yeah. And you can't hold them old things that the other church before you did. You've got to take the message of the hour. He said, what was left over, don't let it stay till morning to come into this other age. Burn it with fire. Be destroyed. That the age that you're living in, the message of this age, has got to be brought out of the Scriptures and vindicated and proved by God that it's God doing so. Then you either receive that or reject it. That's eternal life. Leadership of the Holy Spirit leading His church. We can stay on that a long time. Let's move, just keep moving along. The choice of your conduct. You, could, you can't mix it now. You're either for God or against God. Amen. And the outward expressions shows exactly what's on the inside. Amen. Yeah. The cucklebur. Many of you think, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to heaven. That don't mean one thing that you're going to heaven. Right. No, sir, you can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost every hour in your life and still be lost and go to hell. The Bible says so. That's exactly right. Look here. You are an outside person. You have five senses that contacts that outside body. God gave you five senses. Not to contact Him. Your earthly home. See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. Then you have a spirit on the inside of that. And it has five outlets. Conscience and love and so forth. Five outlets that you contact the spirit world with that. But with your spirit, your physical contacts the physical. Your spiritual contacts the spiritual. But inside of that, you've got a soul. That soul is that gene that come from God. And like a baby formed in its mother's womb. When the baby comes into the, uh, to the mother's womb by the little germ, it crawls into the egg. It doesn't form one cell a human, the next a dog, the next a cat, the next a horse. It's all human cells Amen. because it's building off of an original human cell. And when a man has been born again by the word of God, predestinated to eternal life called the elected. It'll be word of God on top of word, word on word. Hallelujah. Not a denomination, a creed, and then a word and a creed. It won't work. Hallelujah. You can't have that living in it. Only one eternal life. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. Friends, you feed my children. You send me across the mission fields to the world to bring the message. i got to be sincere with you. What I'm looking at, maybe you don't see. That's what I'm here to try to tell you. It's not because I don't love people. It's because I do love people. Hallelujah. Corrective. When I see the slipping of the church, going off and say, well, we did this and we did that. And look around all the church and see that it just won't work. And then look here in the Bible and see it's got to be that way at the end. that lukewarm lady of sin church age. Putting Jesus out the word. He never called. He ain't going to call no church. He said, as many as I love, Amen. I rebuke. I chasten them. Amen. Taking the word and pound it on and telling you're wrong in it. Amen. That's the reason I love you. If you'll open the door and let me in, I'll come in and sup with you. Amen. Not a church she's done put out of that. She's headed for the ecumenical council. That's where she's gone. 
right back into Rome where she come from. And that's exactly how I've got that wrote on paper from 25 years ago, 33 years ago. And there it is, not only that's wrote in the Bible, from a vision, she's gone back. There's no way of saving it. It's gone. It's going to be that way. God's calling individuals. I stand at the door and knock. If any man, any person, one individual out of a thousand, it might be one out of a million. As I said a few nights ago, when Israel come up out of Egypt, there were just two million people come, and just two million, just one, two people went in. One out of a million. Do you know that? Amen. Caleb and Joshua. And Jesus, when he was on earth, they said, Our fathers eat men of the wilderness. We're keeping the traditions and we're doing this. We know where we're standing. He said, I know your fathers eat men of the wilderness. And they're every one eternally separated. They're dead. When the sperm comes from the male or female, there's a million eggs comes, there's a million germs come. And out of all them little germs of the kind, if it's a if it's from the male cow or the man or whatever it is, there's just millions of germs, a million germs working. In there, there's only one of those germs that's ordained to life. Amen. For there's one egg over there fertile to meet it. That's right. Only one egg it'll meet. Just like this body here sitting here, and the germ comes from God. Amen. And watch that little germ come up among all these other germs and wiggle around them right on past them, go over here and find that fertile egg and, and crawl right into it, and the rest of them dies. What if it was that way with the church today? One out of a million. See where it would be? Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there will be that will find it. Most broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there will be a go in there at. Is that truth, Brother Brown? I don't know. But I'm just quoting Scripture. See? Now, you're ordained to life. You see it if you're ordained to see it. If you're not ordained to see it, you won't see it. So they have eyes, but they can't see, ears, and can't hear. How thankful you should be, church. How you should straighten yourself up from these things. How you should be on fire for God. That your eyes beholds what you see. Your ears hears the things you see. Amen. Leadership. Why did you come here tonight? To hear a message like this, branded across the world by the churches as a fanatic. Why did you come? The Holy Spirit led you here. Amen. To listen. Circumcise. Cut away the things of the world except the leadership of Jesus Christ or your parish as sure as the world. You have a choice of conduct. How you conduct yourself, that's up to you. You have a choice of wife. You go out and take your wife. You want to take a wife, you want to take one. It's complimentary to, your, to what you what you're plan your future home to be. Could you imagine a man, a Christian man, going out and taking one of these modern Rick Eddas for a wife? Hmm? Could you imagine? What's the man thinking about? Amen. What kind of a home is he going to have? He takes a strip tease, a burlesque off of the street out here, a street prostitute. Or oh, say, now, wait a minute. How does she dress herself? Amen. Hmm? Wear shorts and things. She's a street prostitute. Right. Oh, you say, now, brother, all them little tight skirts look like you're poured into? Street prostitute. Amen. Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Amen. Then he's got to answer for that. And what she do? She present herself. Who's guilty? Amen. Think of it. Truth. You say they don't make any other clothes. They got goods and sewing machines. No excuse. Amen. Exactly. God ought to hurt you. And this is not a joke. This is thus saith the Lord from the scriptures. It's exactly true, friend. I'm an old man. I haven't got much longer to stay. But I've got to tell you the truth. If this is my last message, it's the truth. See? Don't, sister, don't, brother. And you fellows that's hanging on to a, a creed. And knowing the Word of God being vindicated right before you. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and His realities that we have today. And then because of your creed, turn away from it. Amen. How can you be a son of God and deny the Word of God that's predicted for this last days that we're living in? How can you do it? How can the Bible call this? As I said last night about a, a king one time uh, down in the south when they had the uh, color down there was sold for slaves. Well, there's no more than just a, a used car market. You get a bill of sales on them. I was alarmed at a little uh, place I read one day where a, a broker come along to buy some. And he said, well, now, uh, 
Uh, I'd like, uh, they're sad. You'd have to whip them, make them work because it's away from home. They're sold slaves and they in a foreign country they know nothing about and they'll never be back home again. And they were sad. You had to whip them, make them work. But this broker come by a certain plantation. One young fellow there with his chest out, his chin up. He didn't have to whip him. He was right up. He kept the morals of the rest of them up. The broker said, I'll buy him. He said, he's not for sale. You ain't going to buy him because he's not for sale. He said, well, what makes him so much different? He said, is he the boss or the rest of them? He said, no. He said, do you feed him different? He said, no. He's a slave. He eats out there in the galley with the rest of them. He said, what makes him so much different? He said, I wondered myself to have found out over in Africa where they come from, where the Boers bought them and brought them over here and sold them for slaves. Over there, his father is a tr king of the tribe. And yet an alien away from home, he knows he's a son of a king, so he conducts himself that way. What a rebuke to Christianity. We're supposed to represent God in eternal life. There's only one form of eternal life, and that's God. He alone has eternal life. And we are products of His because we're genes of His Spirit. Then we should conduct ourselves, women and men, like the Bible said for us to do. Not Jezebels of the street and Rickies of the organization, but Christian gentlemen, sons and daughters of God, born to the Spirit of God, manifesting the light in our days and scattering it. Exactly right. But how far we've drifted from it. Why? The same thing this boy did here. He rejected, he refused eternal life because it would cost him his social standing. It cost him his, li his, his uh, 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 luxury of money. It cost him his fellowship in the church. It cost him a lot of things. He knew what it was going to cost him. He was a sensible boy. And he felt that he couldn't pay the price. Yet he thought, I'll just trust my religion and go on. But down in his heart, he knew there was something about Jesus Christ was different from them priests of that day. Amen. And any message that's coming, a genuine born message of God is different from the old trend. Amen. When a divine healing went forth not long ago, do you notice how the impersonators followed it? And every one of them right in them organizations stand there. Did anyone know that there had to be a message follow that? Well, God don't entertain us. Amen. He attracts our attention by something. And when he attracts our attention, then he's got his message. Look, when he first, first come on the earth and started his ministry. Oh, young rabbi, we want you over here in our church. We bring, Come on down here. The young prophet. Oh, we want you over here. Come here. But one day he stood up and said, I and my father are one. Oh, my. He makes himself God. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. He's a vampire. But we have nothing to do with that. Them apostles sat right there. Thousands left Him. But those apostles were ordained to life. He said so. They couldn't explain it. They believed it. Amen. They stayed right with it because He said no man could do these works. Even the priests know that. Nicodemus said, we know, the Sanhedrin Council, that no man could do these works except it be from God. See? Peter on the day of Pentecost said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. Amen. God was with him. Look at the scriptures, what the scriptures said would do. Jesus said, search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They are what testifies of me. Yes. Right. If you would have known Moses, you'd know me. For Moses wrote that I would come in the form that I would come in. He come as the son of man. He comes in three names. Is God three like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Same God. It's three attributes. Now, uh, also, uh, justification, sanctification, Luther, Martin, and, and, the, and the Pentecostal, same thing. Three attributes, three stations, three church ages. Same thing. Water, blood, and spirit. All this is go along. The three elements that takes you back into the body, like it brings you from your natural birth, types your spiritual birth. The baby's born, the first thing's water, X blood, then life. That's where you come into the kingdom of God the same way. See? That's where the church comes in the same way. Same thing. Now notice on these three things, God has formed his forming his body. Now we find that in here that you have a right in your choice. You choose the girl you want to marry. If she accepts you, all right. Then another thing, you have a choice of whether you want to live or whether you don't want to live. You choose now between life and death. You can live. That boy had that choice. He had success and everything else, a religious man. But he knew that when he spoke it of himself, I've observed all these commandments since I was a youth. But he knew he didn't have eternal life. Amen. See? And he had a choice to accept it 
or to refuse it. And he turned it down. That was the most fatal mistake he could ever make. The rest of it wouldn't amount. It doesn't amount unless you take that choice. Now let us follow him, uh, his choosing, and see where it led him to. Now see where he chose. Now look, he was a, he's a rich man. He's a businessman. He was a ruler. And he was a religious man. All that. Today we'd say, boy, he's a genuine Methodist or Baptist or a Pentecostal. He's, he's a real fellow. Real nice boy. Fine. Nothing you say about him. Friendly, nice, sociable and everything. No immorals about him. He didn't probably smoke, drink or run around to shows and dances and whatever we'd call it today. Is we'd class a Christian. But that ain't eternal life. Yet. That ain't what we're talking about. He might have been loyal to his church of what you probably was. But you see, and what did it lead him to? Great popularity. Let's say if he was a preacher. He could have been got a better church. He could have been a state presbyter or a bishop. See? It leads you to popularity. And it led him to riches and to fame. It might do the same thing today. You have a great talent to sing. I thought of that young man a while ago sang that song here. I give that to the devil and now I give that. How different between him and Evelyn Presley and some of these uh, Pat Boone and a group like that. Ernie Ford, them guys, great singers, and take their talents, that God-given talents, and use it to inspire the, the works of the devil. Amen. That's right. Some great singers selling their God-given talents for fame in this world to become somebody. How could you become any more of a body than you could to be a somebody than to be a son of God? Amen. I don't care if you own the whole city, the whole world. And you haven't accepted the leadership of eternal life by the Holy Spirit, Christ. How are you going to? Who, who are you anyhow? You're a dead mortal, dead as sin and trespasses, religious as you want to be, as faithful as you want to be to the church, preacher if you want to be in a pulpit. But to turn down, you die. He was a great success. He was a great success here in this life. Certainly, we find him where we know. Uh, then we find this fella that he went, we follow him a little bit. We see he got a great successful and we follow him through the Bible. We notice that he, uh, he, we find him a rich man. He's got such great big places. He's entertaining the judge and the mayor of the city or what more. He's up on top of his roof and he has great banquets and plenty of waitresses and women, girls and everything else around him. And there's a beggar laying at the gate named Lazarus. He sweeps the crumbs off to him. We know the story. The next thing, he goes on successful. Just like the churches today are getting. A businessman sitting here telling me right here in California that the church has to tell the labor union what to do. See, it's coming church and state. Again. It's right on you. See, you're right in there and you take the mark of the beast not knowing it. If you ever bought one of my tapes, get this one I get when I get home. The Trail of the Serpent. And you'll see where it's at. See where this ends up at. Going home now to speak at the Lord willing. It's about four hours, so I couldn't keep it in one of the meeting like this. I have to go up there where the church suffers with me so long, patiently. Notice. But now, you can listen to the tape sometime in your home. Notice this. Now, we find out that he was a great success. Then we find him later until he was a greater success. Until he said, I have got so much. Boy, he'd have made a real genuine guy this day, wouldn't he? Even my barns is swelled out. They're bursting. And I've got so much that I said, oh, soul, take the rest. But what he done at the beginning, he rejected the leadership of Jesus Christ. His church, his intelligence, his education, and all had led him to a success. All the Jews loved him. He gave to them. He helped them. He might have done this, that, or the other. But you see, he rejected the, the, the leadership of Jesus Christ, the eternal life. And that, the Bible said, he said, Thou fool, tonight your soul is required. Thou, we find him, the next place in hell, lifting up his eyes and seeing that beggar that he turned down the street in the bosoms of Abraham. What a fatal mistake. How that the churches had, 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 had been all right in the way that they went, but they still hadn't had eternal life. It reminds me of a sermon I preached here not long ago, a thinking man's filter. You might have had it. I was going walking through the woods, a squirrel hunting this fall, and I looked down, and of course I can't call the cigarette company, you know it, and there laid a, a cigarette pack laying there, and I just passed by it looking for, uh, in the woods, and I seen that 
package laying there. And I looked back again and said, a thinking man's filter, a smoking man's taste. I just started walking on through the woods and the Holy Spirit said, turn and pick that up. I reached down and picked it up. A thinking man's filter, a smoking man's taste. I thought, an uh, American firm here selling death under disguisement to their own American citizens. A thinking man's filter you and a smoking man's taste. I was at the World Fair with you and Brian and Britain and them up there when he's giving all that test and how they put one cigarette and draw the across a marble and took the uh, wiped up the nicotine and put it on a rat's back, a white rat, and in seven days he's so full of cancer he couldn't walk. And they said, you know, they say a filter. Said it's a gimmick. Sells more cigarettes. It takes so much nicotine to satisfy that devil. Amen. That's right. And when you take a filter cigarette, it takes about four cigarettes to take the place of one. It's a gimmick to sell you more cigarettes. Amen. You cannot have smoke unless you got tar, and tar, you got cancer. See how it is? And the blind Americans looking for a rabbit to come out of a hat somewhere, they fall for it. Amen. You can't have it. It's death. I don't care which way you go. It's death any way you go. A thinking man's filter. A thinking man wouldn't smoke at all. That's right. Hallelujah. He's got any thoughts at all. Amen. Well, I thought that just can apply to the churches. I think, has God got a filter? Yes. And every church has got a filter. Amen. That's right. Amen. They filter the ones that comes in. Amen. And they let a lot of death in too. Amen. How could you ever draw a denomination through God's filter? Amen. How could you do it? How could you draw a bob-haired woman through that filter? Amen. Tell me. How could you ever draw a woman that wears slacks through there? Amen. When it's an abomination for her to put on a garment Amen. pertains to a man. Amen. See, God's filter would catch her out there. It wouldn't let her come in. Amen. But the church has got their own filters. Amen. So I say that there is a thinking man's filter. That's God's word. Amen. And it suits a holy man's taste. Amen. That's right, a holy man. Not a church man, but a holy man's taste. Amen. Because it's pure holiness and adulterated word of God. Amen. There is a thinking man's filter. And church member, I advise you to use that one. Because it brings in the world and one lump of it is death. One lump leavens or one little leaven leavens a whole lump. Amen. Whosoever shall take one word out of this or add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. At the Garden of Eden, what caused death and all this sorrow ever, heartache ever, little dying baby ever, rattle in the throat ever, ambulance screaming ever, hospital ever, graveyard, was because Eve doubted one word. Amen. Not all of it. It just perverted it. Amen. Now, God said, man, there he was to keep every word of God. Now, that's the first of the Bible. In the middle of the Bible, Jesus come, and he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not just part of them, every one. In the last of the Bible, Revelation 22, Jesus gave the testimony of himself, the revelation of, his, uh, of the Bible is Jesus Christ. And he said, Whosoever shall take one word out of here, or add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. Now, you go through that thinking man's filter, you'll have a holy man's taste when you come out of there. Right. You'll have a saintly taste. Sister, you that wear those clothes, think of it. You're going to, you say, I'm virtuous to my husband. I'm virtuous to my boyfriend. I'm a virtuous girl. But what about that sinner that looked at you? When he answers for adultery, who did it? Amen. You'll be guilty. It's written in the Word. So it's, but see, oh, be a thinking woman. Be a thinking man. I say, my, well, what if it does happen to be that way? He said so, and one word can't fail. The great man told me not long ago, call me into his room. So I'm going to lay hands on you, brother. Bram, you're ruining your ministry. Preaching such things. I said, any ministry that the word of God will ruin ought to be ruined. Amen. See? He said, I'll lay hands on you. He said, you're sent to pray for the sick. I said, do you believe those things, brother? He said, no, but it's not our business. I said, whose business is it then? Amen. 
Well, he said, that's a pastor's business. I look at the congregation. Amen. See? Every year I pass through preaching these things, and I think, surely they get it next year, come back, more than ever. <laughs> it goes to show that many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. The leadership is the Holy Spirit, friend. Amen. It leads you and guides you into all truth when He, the Holy Ghost, has come. Now, think of that. Take the thinking man's filter. That's the Bible. Not your creed. Not your church. You'll be lost. Take the thinking man's filter. That's where that boy didn't think. He took the church filter. He became popular, a great man. But in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Now, you take the thinking man's filter, Jesus Christ, the Word. And you'll desire a holy person's taste because it'll satisfy that. If you've got the Holy Spirit in you, this satisfies it. If the Holy Spirit isn't there, you say, oh, well, I don't think that means any difference. Look what you've done, right? there. same thing Eve done. Amen. You're right back in the same place. Now, let's go a little farther. Now, let's take, leave that man there that didn't use the thinking man's filter. He refused to accept the leadership of Jesus Christ to eternal life. Now, let us take another rich, young businessman, a ruler, uh, with the same opportunity that this man had, and um, except it, he accepted the leadership of Christ. Now, there's two of them in the Bible that we're going to talk about. That one, we see that refuse it. Now, let's take this man, another rich, young businessman and a ruler, and he accepted the leadership. The Scriptures tell us about this fellow, if you want to mark it down, in Hebrews 11, uh, 23 to 29. Moses, by faith, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the afflictions of God, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Amen. Greater Amen. treasures than all the treasures of Egypt. Amen. See, he accepted eternal life. Moses esteemed the... The, uh, the reproach of Christ, greater treasures than all the treasures the world had. Moses esteemed that the greatest. Now, this rich man didn't. And Moses was a rich, young ruler to become a Pharaoh. Amen. He was Pharaoh's son and was heir to the throne. And he looked out to the impossible, a bunch of mud daubers, a bunch of slaves. But by faith, he saw the promise of God through the word that his people would sojourn in a strange land for 400 years, but would be brought out by a mighty hand. Amen. And he esteemed that. Hallelujah. Amen. Greater riches than all the treasures of Amen. Egypt. Amen. For he forsook Egypt, not knowing where he was going. Amen. He was led by Christ. Amen. He forsook. And he had his foot on the throne and could been been the next Pharaoh in Egypt. But he esteemed the reproach of Christ. The reproach to be called that odd one. Amen. To be called that fanatic. Amen. To take his place with the mud daubers and the fanatics. Amen. Because he seen that the hour that the scripture was promised to be fulfilled was there then. Amen. And oh, church, wake up. Can't you see the same thing tonight? Hallelujah. The hour that's been promised is on us. Esteem the approach of Jesus Christ. Greater riches than all the fellowship of anything. But it's father and mother, church, anything else. Amen. Follow the leadership of the Spirit. Amen. Let us follow this Christ for a few, uh, this Moses for a little while that uh, did that. Let's watch his life. The first thing when he accepted to take the reproach of Christ and forsake his education, forsake all of his wisdom. He was taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And all of his popularity, his throne, his sepulcher, his kingship, his crown, his, everything he had, he rejected. Amen. And this other fellow wanted it and refused Christ. And this man refused that and accepted Christ. Amen. Amen. And quickly what happened? Hallelujah. He had to separate himself. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. The word means praise our God. It's too bad that we're forgetting it. He rejected the thrones and the popularity. He could have had young girls, by the wives by the hundreds, and he could have had 
sepulchers under Egypt ruled the world. The world laid right at his feet. And he was heir to every bit of it. But by looking in the scriptures, seeing the day he was living in, and know that something in him, the predestinated seed of God went to work. I don't care how popular you could be or how this you could be. You could be a presbyter, you could be a pastor, you could be a this, that, or the other. But if that word of eternal life, but God's word has been foreordained into you and you see the thing at hand, it goes to work. Amen. Moving out like that. Start coming out. You begin to get it. And he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he esteemed the reproach of Christ. Greater treasures than all the riches of Egypt or the world. He esteemed that. Watch what he done. He followed it. Uh, quickly he was ousted from his people. Amen. The people that once loved him. It might cost you everything you've got. It might cost you your home. It might cost you your friendship. It might cost you your stitch and sew party. It might uh, cost you your place at the Kiwanis. It might, I don't know what it'll cost you. But it'll cost everything that's worldly or pertains to the world. You'll have to separate yourself from everything that's worldly. You'll have to do it. Moses laid everything aside and went into the desert with a stick in his hand. Hey, Amen. Days after days passed and wonder if he thought he made a mistake. No. Many times people start out and say, Oh, I'll do it. Glory to God, I'll sit and let somebody laugh at you, make fun of me. Well, probably I was wrong. Amen. He said, They that cannot stand chastisement are bastard children and not the children of God. Amen. See, they're worked up on the emotion. See, these seed that I talked about a while ago, that soul wasn't there to start with. Amen. It was anointed with the Spirit. And you've done all kinds. Oh, you, they, uh, when your spirit's anointed, you can, it's a real genuine Holy Ghost, and you can still be a devil. Amen. Or you say, Brother Brandon, false prophets. The Bible said in the last days it'd be false prophets. Amen. Jesus said there shall rise false Christ. Amen. Not false Jesus is now. Nobody stands still for that. But false Christ. Christ means the anointed ones. Amen. Falsely anointed. They are anointed, but they are false at the bottom of it. Amen. And do great signs and wonders. Speak in tongues. Dance in the Spirit. Preach the gospel. Amen. Judas Iscariot did it. Amen. Simeon, or no, I beg your, uh, Caiaphasus, prophesied. Balaam, the hypocrite. Amen. Sure, done all the signs. Everything, all the religious moves. But you see, uh, you put a cucumber seed and a wheat seed in the same bed and pour the water down upon them and anoint them, they'll both rejoice. Amen. They'll both grow by it. The same water. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. And the rain falls on the just and the unjust. But by their fruit you shall know them. How can you keep from lining up with the word? Hallelujah. Amen. See what I mean? The water falls on the just and the unjust anointed. Jesus said they will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have not I cast out devils? Have not I done prophesied? Have not I done great things in your name? You say, you workers of iniquity, depart from me. I don't even know you. Amen. Go into eternal hell. It's been prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, what a word. Falsely. Worship in vain. Striving in vain. Why do you do that when you don't have to do it? Amen. Why take a substitute when the heavens is full of genuine? Amen. Amen. You don't have to do that. Now. We find Moses anointed. Nothing could turn him back. His own brothers turned him down. That didn't stop him. Amen. He went right on into the wilderness. The Lord. One day out there, he met God face to face with a pillar of fire hanging in a bush. Amen. He said, Moses, take off your shoes. Your ground you're standing on is holy. For I've heard the cries of my people. Amen. And I've heard of their groanings. And I remember my promise of the word. And I'm coming down and will to send you down there. To take him out. Hallelujah. Certainly. He met God face to face. He talked with him. He is commissioned by God. God come right back that same pillar of fire and vindicated that prophet standing right there on the mountain. Amen. To prove that it was. When he took his hands and performed all kinds of miracles and things. Oh, they had the impersonators. Oh, sure. Amen. That was Jambres and Jambres stood right around and done the same thing they did. Amen. But who was the original? Amen. Where did it start from? Did it come from the word? Was it the hour? And do you know that same thing's promised again in the last days? Amen. As Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses, so will these men of reprobate mind concerning the truth. Amen. 
in the last days. To do the same thing, impersonate everything right on in the same gully, hog going to its water and a dog to its vomit. You Pentecostals that come out of them organizations years ago and cursed them, your fathers and mothers, and you turned right back around and done the same thing that they did. And now just the same water and vomit. If it made the church vomit out in the early Pentecostal age, it'll make it vomit out again today. Amen. It has to be, or it's, the shuck has to come. The tossel can't be the only one. The shuck has to come, see, the carrier. Now, we're living in the last days. Watch the things that's promised for the hour. Watch this Moses confirm no. When he got out there, some of his own brother turned up against him on to make an organization. Amen. They said, you act like you're the only holy man among us. Amen. The whole congregation's holy, said Korah. Dathan. Let's choose out man to do something. <sighs> Moses, he, I felt sorry for him. He went out and said, Lord, fell down full of the altar and said, Lord, God said, separate yourself from him. I had enough of it. Just opened up the earth and swallowed him up. He noticed commission. God don't deal with organizations. He don't deal with groups. He deals with individuals. That's right. Always. Not in groups. Individuals. One person in the last days is that I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, not any group, any man will hear my voice. Uh, hear me. I'll come into him and sup. See if any man can hear. How can how could this microphone now produce my voice out there unless it was made thus? I could scream against that board all my might. It wouldn't do nothing. Amen. Because this is ordained, a made, created. A microphone. And if the Word of God is in you from foreordination of God in you, my sheep hear my voice. Amen. They know my hour. Amen. A stranger they won't follow. Amen. It's got to be that first. All that the Father has given me, they will come. Every one of them. See, now he goes on. At the life's end. Here, he only passed Notice when he come to the end of the road, and we're closing now because it's getting late. 25 minutes till 10. Notice. Now at home, that's early. About 2 or 3 o'clock, we get to say, it's getting a little bit late. See? <laughs> but now, I preach him any night all night long. Paul preached this same gospel in his day. And a young man fell off of a, a wall and killed himself. And Paul, with that same anointing, with that same gospel, laid his body up on him. He come to life. They were interested. The church was being farmed. Something was taking place. Notice what taking place here. Moses, when he come down, this rich man, when he come down, the young ruler we talked about, all religious and belonged to church and everything, fine and educated, a fine businessman and everything. When he come to the end of the road, he began to scream. There's no word of step. Where's his leadership? He had been led by his church, which is dead. He'd been led by the dead world, and it wasn't nothing for him to step into but what the world had prepared for it. Hell. But here comes Moses, a faithful servant who esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater treasures than all the riches of Egypt. He come to the end of the road, an old man, 120 years old, walked up on the mountain. And you know what a death laid before him? He looked over into the promised land. And he looked laying there by his side. There was his leader, the rock. He stepped up on the rock, and the angels of God packed him away into the glory of the glory of God, into the bosoms of God. Why? Eight hundred years later, he was still being led by his leader. We find him over on Mount Transfiguration, standing there with Elijah, talking to Jesus before he went to the cross. Eight hundred years after death, the the one that he esteemed the reproach of his ministry, greater treasures and all the popularity of the world and all the money of the world, his leader was still leading. Amen. Oh, my. He was led, his leader. He led through the death, the shadows of death. He was led to the grave. Hundreds of years later, there he stood again because as his youth, he had chosen the leadership of the Holy Spirit. His name will be great when there is no more Egypt for treasures. Amen. When the pyramids are dust. And when the Egypt is no more Egypt, Moses will be immortal among men because he accepted the leadership of Christ Amen. instead of going the way his church went. There's others that did the same thing. Look at Enoch. 
He walked with God for 500 years. And then he had a testimony that he pleased God. God had verified it and said, There's no need of you dying. Just come on up home this afternoon. And he went up. And Elijah, after boiling out bob-haired women and everything as he did in his day, Jesse Bells with a paint on them, after he got so full of it and, and have done all he could and all that priest making fun of him and everything else, he walked down to the river one day and just across the river was a horse that's hitched to a bush over there, a chariot of fire and a horse is a fire. He stepped right on and threw his robe off to the next prophet to follow him and went up into heaven. Amen. He accepted the leadership of eternal life because it was Christ that was in Elijah. Oh, yes, sir. What was it? Follow me. Now, you must choose your leader. You've got to choose it, friends. Look in God's looking glass, the Bible, and see where you're at tonight. A little story. A little kid one time lived out in the country. He'd never seen a mirror. And he came into the city to see his mother's sister. And she had, uh, had a home. And the old-fashioned homes used to have a mirror on the door. I don't know where you remember that or not. But uh, this little boy, he'd never seen a mirror, so he's playing around the house. And he looked in the... <laughs> He looked at that little boy and he waved and the little boy waved and he pulled his ear and the little boy pulled his ear and so on like that. He kept walking up close and he turned around and said, Mama, that's me. That's me. What do you look like? What are you following? What have we done? You must choose your leader. Choose the day. You choose life or death. Your choice will determine your eternal destination. What you choose. Remember, Jesus said, follow me. And you're invited tonight to do so. And to follow him to eternal life, you must come on his terms. That's right. The word. Not upon the creed. Not upon the public opinion. Not upon what anybody else thinks about it, but on what God said about it. You say, well, Brother Bram, I know a woman's as good as she can be. She does this. I know a man that went through this. I can't help what they've done. God's Word, he said, let every man's word be a lie and mine be the truth. Amen. You've got to come on his terms. Come on his conditions, the Word. You cannot come through creed. You cannot come through denomination. You cannot mix it like that. There's only one thing you can do. Accept it on his terms. Amen. That you're willing to die to yourself and all your thoughts and follow him. Get rid of all the things of the world and follow me. I know that's a stern, cutting message, brother. But I didn't come here and choose a, a message to the people just to try to make them sing, shout, holler. I've been in heathen meetings where they've done the same thing. I'm interested in your life. I'm a servant of God that's got to answer to God someday. And the ministry that the Lord has given me has vindicated itself thousands of times before you. Amen. Remember, Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. Get rid of what you've got and follow me. And that's the only way to have eternal life. That's the only remedy He gives this man. It's the only remedy He gives this businessman. It's the only remedy He gives anybody. His choice, He makes His decision. It's perfect every time. And we must follow Him. It is the only way to have eternal life. So the leadership of God is followed the vindicated word of the hour by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us bow our heads. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be real sincere. I want a sister to play this for me. I can hear my Savior calling. I know it's an old-time altar call. And brother, sister, as we see... Just look what's going on today now with your heads bowed. Just think for a minute. Look what's taking place. Did you read the newspaper last week what that man in England said? That the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was only a fake. It was only fixed up between Pilate and him. Did you see what this American theologian said? He said that uh, uh, Jesus was just put to sleep on mandrake weed. Many of you theologians know back here in Genesis where it talked to the mandrake wheat. It'll put you to sleep like you're dead. Your heart hardly beats for two or three days at a time. And when they give him the vinegar and gall, they said that was mandrake weed. And they put him up there in the tomb and he slept up there for three days. Of course, when they went up there, they found him walking around. Could you imagine that? Theologians, seminaries, make believe.
Then how in the world, first place the Bible said he refused it when they put the vinegar and gall in his mouth. And another thing, if that be so, then why did those disciples who come and stole him away, why did they give their life and mourn them for him? And fell, count themselves not even worthy to die like he died. Turn them upside down and sideways on the crosses and things. And if they were know that he was a hypocrite and them own selves being hypocrites, how would they have given their life for him like that? Oh, you see, it's this intellectual day that we're living in. Education, civilization, and the modern trend of the day is all of the devil. Civilization of the devil? Yes, sir. The Bible said it is. This civilization has death. Will we have a civilization like this in the other world? No, sir. We'll have a different kind of civilization. Education, all these things, they're of the devil. Science, perverting the natural things, making something else. Look what they've done to you now. When young ladies... And the Reader's Digest said week a uh, month before last, I believe it was, the Reader's Digest said that young men and young women go through the middle age, women in menopause, between 20 and 25 years old. One more generation, there'll be nothing but... Uh, it'll be horrible looking. What the creatures will be. Softened. Mucky. Look at the, look at the spirit. Look how the spirit in the church has got. Hybrid. Intermarried. To the world. Oh, what an hour. Flee, children. Flee. Flee to the cross. Come to Christ. Let Him lead you. While we have our heads bowed, our eyes closed, and please bow your heart at the same time, will you? I want to ask you a question. Do you really look at yourself to God? And do you feel that you're not where you, you ought to be at this hour because a rapture could come at any time? See, it'll come... There'd only be, if, if that statement I made a while ago is true, there'll only be about 500 people in the rapture that's living will be changed. Or taking all Christendom together, Catholic and all, there's only 500 million people. See, it claims Christianity. And one out of a million be 500 people. There's that many people missing every day across the world that we can't even count for them. See, it'll come and you won't even know it. People go on preaching and saying, see, and it'll all be passed. Like Jesus said, they said to the disciples, said, what does it say? The scribes say Elias must first come. He said, he's already come and you didn't know him. But they did to him what they said they would do. You know that you're not right with God. And you'd like to be remembered in, to God that God would set your heart right with God. Would you just humbly now in this very still moment, raise your hands. I don't care who you are. Would you do it? You say, I'll raise my hands to God. God bless you. God bless you. Are you looking in the mirror? I ask you in Christ's name. Are you looking in God's mirror? Mm. <laughs> Oh, my people, uh, even this hour am I moving upon thy hearts. Even this hour, wilt thou judge thyself? Or if thou shalt judge thyself, the Lord will not judge thee nor condemn thee. Behold, the Lord hath called thee to a high and holy calling. Yea, and even now doth the Lord uh, brood over thee in love and in mercy. Yea, if thou shalt confess thy sin, yea, the Lord shall cleanse thee and forgive thee, and he shall cause thee to mount up with wings as eagles, and thou shalt be filled with his power, and he shall wash thee by the water of his word, he shall renew thee, he shall change thy heart, and give thee a heart of flesh. For behold, the day of the Lord is at hand. Wilt thou even, uh, as the old world uh, who paid no attention uh, to my preacher Noah, who went about uh, unconcerned and complacent, uh, who dishonored God, uh, yea, and then sell it to the Holy Spirit, uh, went about in everyday life, uh, as though the Lord uh, meant not uh, what he said and what he would do, for behold, the word of the Lord overtook them, and behold, they all perished. Uh, therefore, I say unto thee, uh, this is an evil hour. 
This is an evil day. And thou shalt not be deceived if thou shalt be led by my spirit and conform to my word. For behold, I shall keep thee and preserve thee. And I shall keep thee true. And I shall revive thee unto the day of my coming. Amen. I want to ask one thing. How many in here are Pentecostals? Raise your hand. Are Pentecostals? Practically every one of you. Now, how many in here claim to be Christians? Raise your hands. Everywhere you are, claim to be Christians. Did you know the Bible spoke of this, that this would happen? Even this happened in the Old Testament when they were wondering what they would do, how they could get away from the besiege that was coming. The Spirit fell upon a man and he prophesied and told him where to meet the enemy and how what how, how overcome the enemy. That was the Old Testament, same as the New. Now some of you might say, that man, oh, that wasn't so. But what if it is so? You say, oh, I've heard that before, but what if this is so? You see, that proves that it in here, there's many that needs a change of heart, if that's the Holy Spirit speaking. There's things that needs to be done. So now, it's with you. Just as I am without one plea, but That's what he called you, Justin. To thee, O Lamb of God. I'll take away that stubborn heart and put a heart of flesh in it that will yield to me. Come just as I am, thou will receive. Will you make your choice tonight? You can do either one you want to. Clean. You say, I've heard that before, but this might be your last time to hear it. Because I promise I believe. Old-fashioned altar calls. They're out of style today, but God still moves in them. Can't you feel it moving on your church? I come mm. Oh, thank the day the hearts are becoming stony, filled with the world, indifferent church members, lukewarm, like that rich young ruler, and don't know that the great Holy Spirit standing, knocking at the door in this latest sea and age, he that will hear my voice the word I'll open his heart I'll come in to him and we'll sup with him and the spirit speaking through this brother a few minutes ago said I'll take that stony heart out of you and give you a heart of flesh tender towards God look how it's become now just a, a intellectual emotion see not a tender heart full of love and sweetness towards Christ mm. don't you want that kind of a heart how you go to face Christ with the intellectual conception of Him? You've got to accept eternal life. Wash it. The preparation is made through the blood. And that thou bid. What did He do? Shed His blood and now bidding you come to thee. Oh. Of God I come. I come. Let's each Christian just raise our hands quietly now and pray. Oh God, please Lord, catch this day that we're living. Oh, it's so hard, Father. Satan has just done so much to the people. Their hearts have become stony. Your spirit speaks right out. Your word comes forward, vindicates. But the old-fashioned, born-again experience, it's become into a denominational intellectual conception 
a lot of music, a lot of shouting, a lot of carrying on, but really that heart of flesh, that spirit, that eternal life, has certainly become foreign to the church. God, it breaks my own heart, me a, a sinner, saved by your grace. It makes me feel so bad, Father, to see the church that you died for, the church that you're trying to redeem. I think of the vision you just give about that church of the United States and of other countries. What a horrible looking rock and roll striptease it was. But somewhere along, I've seen coming forth another one. Blessed. I pray, Father, that if any of those here tonight is ordained to life or would like to accept it, that this will be the hour they'll do it. Grant it, Lord. Break up the stony heart now, the old heart of the world. And if they want peace. They want something that satisfies, something that gives assurance. May they accept the leadership of Christ tonight to lead them to a, a peace that passes all understanding, a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Uh, even something that death itself cannot harm. Grant it, Father. Now, with our hands up, I wonder if how many in the building now would just say, I'm going to stand. Now, I don't care who's sitting by you. It's God talking to you. And you really want to be a real Christian. See, anything unless that's an impersonation. Well, I'd just rather go on out and be in the world. I believe you would too. Now just examine yourself by the word, by the message. Examine what a real Christian should be, rugged, loving, not one of this modern Christianity, white, soft, flexible, half-dead, rotten, interbred. See? It's not the real Christianity. Live any kind of a way and belong to church. Don't you want that sweet fellowship with Christ, the Holy Spirit, that your, the conformity of your own heart to the word move right up into Christ? If you want that and would desire God to see your stand tonight right in this group of people, if you'll just do it. You say, will that mean anything, Brother Branham? Oh, yes, sure it does. If you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the holy angels. But he that will confess me and stand for me in this land, I'll stand for him in that land. I'll confess him before my Father. Now, no matter who you are, woman, man, boy, girl, whoever you are, Christian or not Christian, minister, deacon, whatever you are, if you will just believe with your whole heart for just a moment and do this much tonight just to let God know that you're sincere. God, I'm, look, I'm a Pentecostal, you say. I'm this or whatever you are. I profess to dance in the Spirit, but Brother Bram, I thought as long as we had that, we had it. You haven't. If you believe me to be God's prophet, you listen to my words. That's a deception in this day. Didn't the Bible say it'd be so close to deceive the elected if possible? They elected down to the soul. But if you dance in the Spirit, still with the things of the world, there's something wrong. If you speak with tongues, Paul said, I can speak with tongues of men and angels and still not even be saved. Mm -hmm. Both kinds, see? I can do all the emotions. I can have faith. I can preach the gospel. I can give all my goods to feed the poor. I can carry the word in the mission fields across the world. I still am nothing. See? It's that inside of the inside, brother. That's, your spirit breaks up when you die. It takes its flight, but your soul lives. See? Now, look at yourself. Really, are you a genuine Bible Christian, full of love of God? You remember the Bible said in the last days when this time takes place, he said a marking angel went through the churches, went through the cities, and sealed only those who sighed and cried for the abomination that was done in the city. Is that right? Ezekiel 9, we know that's true. The marking angel went forth and put a mark on their head, forehead, sealed them. Then that sighed and cried. After that come the slaughtering angels from the four corners of the earth, which is coming right away. We see it coming. War is moving right in. that will kill the whole earth off. And there was nothing that they couldn't touch but them that had the mark. Now, pick out, is your heart so concerned about the sinners and the way that the church and the people are doing till you can sigh and cry about it day and night? If not so... I'm wondering, that's the scripture, would you just stand and say, Dear God, I'm not standing because Brother Branham said so, but I heard his word say that, and I'm going to do this. To you, Lord, I stand. I'm in need, Lord. Will you supply my need tonight here at this place? I stand. God bless you.
God bless you. I'm in need. I want you to have mercy upon me. God bless you. I want to be the kind of a Christian that... Now remember the person is standing by you. It's the same thing you are. I want you just to reach over and take a hold of their hand and say, Brother, sister, pray for me now. I want you to pray for me. I, I, just say it with all Christian sincerity. Pray for me. I, 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 I want to be right with God. You pray for me. I'm going to pray that God will give you the opportunity. I, I know that we're, we can't stay here much longer. You see that. We're, we're at the end time. All that believe that say amen. amen. We're, there's nothing left. Everything is gone. The churches is headed to the ecumenical council. The world. Is, look here. Do you know what the Lord says about Los Angeles and these places here? She's gone. You remember what I told you about two years ago? How that earthquake would come in up here in Alaska? I'll also tell you that Hollywood and Los Angeles is sliding into the ocean. California, you're doomed. Not only California, but you world. You're doomed. Church, unless you get right with God, you're doomed. Thus saith the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard me use that name unless it come to pass? Ask you. You've known me 20 years. Did I ever tell you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? If everything I've ever told you would happen, happen, say amen. amen. I tell you, now's the hour. You better be getting right, all of us. Now, let's each one pray for the other. Dear God, as we stand here tonight, a dying people, our faces are turned towards the earth, the dust. We've just, you have given us this cutting sermon, Lord. We see the example of two men. One of them, being a religious man, went to church, but rejected the leadership to eternal life. And the other rejected the worldly fame and turned to eternal life. And we see both of their conditions tonight. According to the Bible, the rich man is in torment and Moses is in glory. Father, we want to be like Moses. We want to be led by your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, to eternal life. Give it to our hearts tonight, Lord. Tear out the old stony heart. Place into us the new heart, the heart of flesh. The heart that you can talk to and deal with. And we will not be haughty or different. May the Holy Spirit never leave, Lord. May it come and ordain this people. Speak to them. Tear up their stony wills and put in the will of God. Save every one, Father. Give us of thy love. Get us to a place, Lord, that we'll get away from all the, the emotional part to the real solid part of the feeling, the heartfelt part, the deepness of the Spirit, the riches of God, the kingdom of the Spirit in our hearts. Grant it, O great leader, great Holy Spirit, before you take your flight into the skies with your church, O oh God, let me go, Lord. Don't leave me behind, Jesus. Let me go with you, Father. I don't want to stay here on this earth to watch these tribulations coming on. I don't want to stay here in this insanity. I don't want to stand here when hideous sights of people losing their mind. We look at man trying to act like beast and look like beast. And the women trying to look like animals with the paints on their face, knowing that these things are predicted to happen. That the thing will they'll go so insane to locusts will raise up with hair like women to haunt the women and teeth like lions and things that you said. The mental condition of the people will be completely gone. We see it in the making right now, Lord. Help us restore us to the sane mind of Christ Jesus our Lord, O oh, great leader of eternal life. We accept your promise tonight, Father. I plead for this people. I plead for every one of them. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that Christ, the Son of God, will come into the hearts of every one of us, Lord, and mold us and make us into new creatures in Jesus Christ. Grant it, Lord God. We love you and we want our dispositions, our change to come into us that we can be your children. Feel of your spirit moving in our hearts, Lord, tendering us and bring us to realization of this insane age that we're living in. Grant it, God. When we see young women so 
caught up in the web of the devil. Young man, perverted minds, children, dope addicts, cigarette smoking, drinking, immoral, Satan's Eden. God had taken you 6,000 years, according to the Bible, to build an Eden. And you put your son and his wife in there, his bride, to rule over it. And Satan come around and perverted it. He's got 6,000 years and he's built his own intellectual Eden through science and education and so-called intelligence. And he's built it into a mess of death. Oh, God, take us back to Eden again, Lord, where there's no death, where there's no sorrow. Grant it, Lord, we stand humbly waiting for the second Adam to come for his bride. Make us part of him, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you love God? Can you feel? Do you realize what I'm trying to tell you? If you can understand, just raise your hands. I understand what you're trying to say. Can you see the insanity of this age? Look, how it's gone. There's no even reasons among the people no more. It's gone. Where is our even leaders? Look at our president. If they want communism, let them have it. Whatever the people want, let them have it. Where is our Patrick Henry's, our George Washington's? Where is our leaders that can stand for a principle? We haven't got them no more. Where is our churches, our ministers, or take the people in just on prohibition or come in, join the church and do this or have a little sensation or something? Where is those men of God, those prophets that stand out and dare to defy, defy all the things of the world? Where is those men of integrity? Where are they at? They so soften through intellectual conceptions and things till they're not here no more. Oh, God, have mercy upon us. These hideous sights that's coming up on the earth. You can see how the people's moving right into it. It's an insanity. But when that thing strikes, the church will be gone. God, let us be there. That's my prayer. To the great supernatural being that's in this building tonight, the great Christ that still has eternal life, I pray thee, Christ, as I hear with my eyes open looking at the church that you redeemed with your blood, God, don't let a one of us be lost. We want to be right with you. So cleanse us, O Lord, from all of our iniquities. Take away our sins and things. We've seen you heal our sick, even raise our dead. Come back to life through prayer. And we've seen all these things happen, Father. Now bring us back to life spiritually. Bring us back in the realization of eternal life through Christ Jesus. Grant this, Father. I commit it all to you in Jesus Christ's name. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet. Look to him, let him soften us up. God be with you till we meet again. Raise your hands out till we meet.